So we're going through Ephesians, and from uh, the very first chapter on, Paul has been talking about the great plan of God for salvation in the world. And he, he begins with this great epic story that starts in the of the past, that is centered on Jesus, that um, come, you know, that impacts human history, that brings as a result of God's work, Jesus' work, the church. We've been looking at, at how God wants to grow the church in, in unity and in maturity and, and it, its effect and its expansion. And we are beginning to look at now, this, the, this continues into the next chapter, into chapter 5, we're looking at how this impacts us as people and in our day-to-day -day life. And what we're really seeing this morning is God's great plan for making us like his son Jesus. You know, how God intends to do a work in our lives to change the way that we are and to make us more like Jesus. And this is just the beginning of that, but it's, it's very important. Um, God has a great plan, and his plan, he has a great plan for your life, and his great plan for your life is to make you more like his son. And we're going to look at a little bit of what that means. Uh, but the first step of that plan is that we die. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify that a little bit. I'm going to qualify that a little bit. But that we die to our old life, to die to our old nature. So I want us to look at that a little bit this morning. Let's start with verse 17 there to 22. Paul here describes believers, believers and followers of Jesus, as those who have learned Christ or learned about Christ. Um, have heard all about him, right? Verse 21, you've heard about him and were taught in him or taught the truth that is in Jesus. So what is this learning about Jesus or learning Christ, learning Jesus? I think Paul's going back to our earlier in chapter 4, not all of you were, were here for this, but earlier in chapter 4, Paul's describing how God grows the church, or how Jesus grows the church. The risen, victorious Jesus it gifts uh, people, gifts leaders to the church. He gives these leaders gifts, and these leaders are a gift to the church. Uh, we saw this, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And these are people who work with the Word of God, the Scriptures, and the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And they equip, they empower, and they train every believer so together we all do the work of the ministry. Okay, so that together we're learning about the gospel, we're learning about God, we're learning how to, uh, uh, how we, you know, first pursue and discover our gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to put our gifts into practice, and to serve one another. That's sort of the background to all this, okay? All of us learning about Jesus, learning about who he is, learning about what he did for us, learning about the story of God in the Bible, and seeing how it affects us and changes us, and equips us and empowers us to serve one another. We saw all this in the previous passage. And the result of this, of all this, is the church growing in unity and together growing as a body to become more like Jesus overall. Okay? And it's important when we say become more like Jesus, it, we don't mean that God wants to obliterate our individual personalities. Okay? While we are still who we are. Uh, wired the way that we are with the personalities and quirks and preferences that we are and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, to make us, as we are, more like Jesus in the way that we live. One way that uh, theologians have talked about this is grace, God's grace, God's kindness, God's saving help. Grace does not obliterate nature, does not obliterate who we are, but grace redeems nature. God redeems who we are and equips us to glorify him and serve others and bless others. So that's all the background, and this still probably feels a little bit abstracted, but all this chapter begins to ground us. How do we change? And he begins by saying there are two sides to the change coin. God wants to change us, and there are two sides to this. And by the way, one thing to think about as we look at this is um, and it's important to understand this. God doesn't want to change us. God doesn't have a plan to change us so that he can then love us, so that he can then forgive us and love us. Okay? It is true. God loves you 
as you are today. God loves you exactly as you are today. With the good, bad, and ugly of who you are, in Christ, he loves you today. But he also loves you too much to leave you as you are today. He loves you. He forgives you in Christ. He embraces you. You have nothing to prove to him. You have, uh, there are not brownie points so that you are more or less his son or daughter. But God loves you and it is to your good and to your joy, as well as to his glory, and as well as to the good, the good of others, that we become all like his son. So God has a plan to change us. So there are two sides to this coin. One is this dying to self that I mentioned before. And we see this in verse 22, that we are to put off our old self. The, the Greek is literally put off the old man. Okay, and that's a weird phrase, but what's likely being thought of here is to put off our old Adam. Okay, we are people who are born with Adam's sin. We are born and we repeat and we replicate Adam's rebellion against God. Okay, we come with an Adam mindset. We have a we come with an Adam way of approaching the world, seeing the world. Uh, we have come with an Adam set of priorities and drives and ambitions, and God wants to replace that man, as it were, that Adam way of thinking, that fallen way of thinking, with the new man, with Jesus Christ, the new Adam, the new man. That's kind of the picture here. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Um, and then verse 24, and put on the new self, right? Put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so uh, Paul almost uses the image of taking off old garments, taking off an old set of clothes. You know, maybe uh, 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 clothes that you have that uh, are stained with oil and mud and whatever. And he's using an image of taking that clothing off, taking off that way of thinking, way of deciding, uh, a way of prioritizing things in your life, um, take that off and put on a new way of thinking, a new way of feeling, a, a new way of making decisions, a new way of prioritizing things in your life. Um, this process of doing away with the old life, your old habits, your old way of thinking, and so on, is what theologians have all, often called mortification, put to death your old way of life. Um, so there's actually one form of murder that's allowable in the New Testament. Okay? You can murder your old life. You can put to death your old way of thinking. Okay? It's a little bit like this. I don't know if you've ever, if you play an instrument, like maybe guitar uh, or piano or something, but if you were, if you've ever been self-taught, and I don't mean you got online and did a course, that's what self-taught means these days. I'm talking about you just you just figure out a couple of chords and started playing a few songs and kind of developed a good ear. Um, I knew a lot of friends growing up who played guitar very well, but no one taught them anything. They knew no music theory, right? They just saw some songs, you know, and, and just figured out the chords and, and figured out how to play. Well, if you learn an instrument that way, but then you go to guitar class with a guitar instructor, with a guitar professor. Half of the work, if not more, especially in the early stages of your classes, is he's going to have to teach you how to unlearn all the bad habits that you've developed by self-teaching. No, that's not the way that you play that chord. No, that's not how you do this or that. You have to unlearn a lot of bad habits that in some ways make you a bad player before you can then go on to learn uh, how to play, I guess to say, guitar properly, how to understand music theory. I, I went through that process. I sort of knew how to play guitar, but then I went to guitar class, and I would play a few things, and I could just see the professor cringe and go, no, we're gonna have to do away with that. We're gonna have to. And the Christian life is very similar. A big part of the Christian life is unlearning the things that we have, just the way of thinking, the way of approaching, the way of, of, of addressing things, of evaluating things. A big part of it is unlearning how to play the guitar of our life, as it were. And that's what Paul is saying, is you've got to get rid of those old habits, and you have to step into your new life. You've got to redress yourself with a new way of thinking. Look at verse 24 again. He says, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. 
So in contrast with mortification, unlearn the old way of living, Paul says we've got to feed vivification, right? We've got to fan into flame and encourage a new type of life, a new series of habits, a new way of thinking, okay? Uh, looking at life the way God looks at it. Learning to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Uh, learning to love others the way God loves others. Learning to define things like love the way that God defines them, okay? This is the other side of the coin. We have mortification and vivification. Okay, that all sounds good. How do I get started with, with this? Let me ask Where do I start? Well, verse 22, it's interesting. Verse 22 has mortification. Just look at that. Verse 24 has vivification, fan into flame, this good side, the, 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 the life that's like God. And how we get started is the ham in the, in the sandwich. Verse 23 in the middle. Look at verse 23 with me. It, it bridges these two ideas. Verse 23 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Paul says you need to be spiritually renewed from the inside out. That's the idea. And I think spiritual here, in the spirit of your minds, it's, I think he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, capital S, Spirit. Okay? And in Romans 12, verse 2, Paul says something similar. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not align yourself to this world's way of thinking, acting, feeling, deciding, and so on. That's the Adam way of thinking. That's the old way of thinking. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, he says. And that leads to a changed life. So how does this happen? How does this happen? Well, it starts with what we've been discussing. It starts with gathering together with God's people. It starts with exposing yourself to God's word. It starts with learning to speak to God and praying. It starts with worshiping God and singing to him and expressing your love and affection for God. It starts with being trained and equipped to serve others, serve others in your church family and serve others in the wider community. One of the reasons why, as we've discussed so many times, we're trying to do connect groups. It's putting ourselves out there. It's learning to serve. And as we do so, we discover how we are gifted and we discover how we have certain strengths that we can bring to the church and help the church by serving that way. It's in all this dynamic of learning the Word of God, studying the Word of God, singing the Word of God, praying the Word of God, speaking to God, serving one another, uh, being available, growing and being equipped, and then going out there and using the way you've been equipped and empowered in practice. In that whole dynamic, God is teaching us and renewing us and getting us to change our minds. And it's not instantaneous. It's not a flash. It's not a thunderbolt. It's in the dynamic of growing and developing and growing together. It's everything that we've seen here. I think in with Cornerstone, a lot of us are good at absorbing information and learning. But where I think the challenge still lies for us is, for some of us, not for all of us, but for some of us is, how do I stretch? How do I step into service? Because you can sit here and, and, and you can hear me talk about put on the new self and go, yeah, 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 that's great. But often in practice, the way that I put on my new self is in taking concrete steps of obedience and concretely looking to serve others with what I am learning, with what I'm being gifted with and empowered with. You know, on some days, for example, we need more people to volunteer to greet outside and welcome people as they, as they come in, especially as new people sometimes come, come in and not sure what's going on here. They need someone to guide them and help them in, and here's a bulletin, and you can sit here, and so on and so forth. Uh, or do we, you know, we need more volunteers to be able to help with children's church. It's basically two or three people who are doing it every Sunday. A lot of us reap the benefits of that, but we need help and workers and volunteers to make that happen. Our connect groups are a great place to do that. Some of you have already been trained up with that. Some of you are, have started the, the training for connect groups. Uh, first week of August, we've got new materials. We've got new books. You know, we've got a quick course too, Making Disciples of Jesus and Multiplying Small Groups. How to do that? We've got a course. If you're interested, let me know. You can take a book and get trained up. What I'm trying to say is the change that happens in Christ is 
partly learning and partly putting ourselves out there and actually doing something. And if we just learn information about this, what I've seen over and over again in practice, I think it's what the Bible teaches, but what I've seen over and over again in practice is not much change happens. Not much change happens. The Bible's emphasis over and over again is God is interested in the pure knowers of the word, what he's interested in doers of the word. The word of God is a word meant to put, be put into practice. We obey. Now, this process, process of putting our old nature to death, putting it away and putting on our new life, it, it happens in a continuous tension. So, there's not one moment where I put off my old way of thinking and acting and doing and feeling and suddenly put on my new nature and it's done. It's a continual messy process. Three steps forward, two steps back. Three steps, it's a tango. It's a messy tango. Uh, if we were to graph it, hopefully over our, the course of our lives, the line, right, the graph is going up, but it's lots of peaks and valleys, and some of the valleys are very low, right? And you have to struggle to get back up. It's a messy process, and it's a process in which we're doing this together, and we're hopefully helping each other out, so that if someone stumbles, I'm helping them up, and then maybe in a little while, if I stumble, that person's helping me up. And I think a lot of us have been in church long enough that we've experienced that. We've had the opportunity to be the person to help someone who has stumbled back up, to get back into the race and to keep moving forward. And sometimes we've been the person who has stumbled and fallen and needed someone to help us back up and, and finish the race. That's how it happens. It has to happen that way, and it happens together, and it doesn't happen individually. That's why we can't imagine any of this happening individually. And in a way that's isolated. That's why the church body and church community is so important. But the last thing I want to say is a big part of this is, and a big part of the power that we can find to do this and to see change in our life is to understand that it's about working out what God has already worked in. Or to work out what, what God has already accomplished for us. On our behalf. Um, this is what we, we see a little bit uh, carried out in in verses 24, sorry, 25 to 32. But one way to think about this is when you get married, some of us are married, some of us are not, but I think you understand this. When you get married, once the, the civil servant or the pastor or the priest says, I now pronounce you man and wife, you are married. Your status has changed and your life has changed. Trust me. Uh, one way or the other, forever. Okay, the changes happen. Okay, you don't need to then work to become married at the end of a process. No, you're married at that moment. Okay. Now, what it means to be married is a whole other ball of wax. What it is like to carry out that new status is something completely different, right? Understanding what it means to live with a person, to share financial responsibility, responsibilities, to make decisions together, right? To work out what drives the other person nuts about you and to learn to compromise and work things out together, how to live together in a home. Uh, all of this is a process. All of it is messy. All of it is difficult. But ideally, we're working toward giving expression to the fact that we are now, right, one flesh. We've come together as one and we are working this out, okay? That's the Christian life. You are a son of God or daughter of God if you trust in Christ. You are forgiven. You are a new creation. You have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to work to obtain those things, but you have them by decree, as it were. You have it by declaration. But now the Christian life is, how do I work this out? How do I work this out? But you work it out as someone who is already a son and daughter. You work it out as someone who is already forgiven. You don't work it out to obtain those things. So you work it out from that place of security and peace. Now, what's good, and this is how I want us to finish up as we look at verses 25 to 32. What's helpful is that Paul gives a couple contrasts here 
that help us think about what this looks like. Because you can go, okay, you put to death the old self and you put on the new self. What does this mean? How does this work out in practice? Paul gives us several options. He gives us at least five contracts. We're not going to look at all of them. And this is not exhaustive, but it helps us think about what this looks like. Okay? So look at 24 with me uh, to, to start. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 25. 25. Having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Do you see it? So he says, don't just stop lying, right? Stop lying. That's mortification. So if you have been lying, or have, if you've been speaking falsehood, if you have been speaking things that cause damage, right, to yourself and others, stop lying. Mortification. But the process is not complete merely by refraining from lying. Right? Just because you refrain from lying and you just speak your mind about everything doesn't mean that you become more like Jesus. Stop lying, but what? Speak truth with one another. And I think we can derive from other passages, even in Ephesians, that this is truth with love. This is truth to build others up. Okay? So what does it look like with speech? Stop lying. Speak the truth. Speak the truth in a way that is helpful, healing. And edify. Another verse, uh, another example in verse 28, for example, it says, Let the thief no longer steal. Stop stealing if you're a thief. Mortification. That's the old way of thinking, that's the old nature. Stop stealing. But the process isn't over just because you don't steal anymore. But rather labor, doing honest work with your own hands, with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. I really love this example. Think about it. You're, you've been a thief. You've been someone who has stolen in whatever way. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you trust Jesus, and you begin to follow Jesus. So to become more like Jesus doesn't mean that, well, now I'm going to stop stealing. I've, I've, I've stopped stealing. That's one aspect. That's one side of the coin, right? But that's not the end of the process. What's the end of the process? Start working so that you can have some money to provide for others. That's good. That's still not the, other, the, the end of the process. What's the end of the process? Work so that you can have a little extra so that you can then be generous with others. You see how we went from stealing, taking away from others, to being in a position where you can give away. That's the full arc. That's the full cycle. Okay? That's putting, putting to death the old man, but also taking on a new way of thinking. Not merely, I need to stop stealing and have enough to provide for myself, it's I need to stop stealing and have enough so that I can give away to those who do need it. Do you see that? That's the putting off and putting on, right? Very specific examples. The destiny of holiness is always to impart grace and help to others, not just I don't do bad things. You catch that? Because that's Jesus. Jesus didn't merely not do bad things, Jesus imparted healing, salvation, help to others. Another change, verse 29, it also involves words. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Put off hurtful words, gossip, slander, nastiness, anything that was gross or inappropriate. Instead, use words that are good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace, there it is, in part something, give grace to those who hear. So again, not merely I'm going to stop gossiping, Though if you're gossiping and you're being nasty about people, definitely stop. But that's not the end. Use your speech to build people up. To lift them up. To empower them in the best sense, in the biblical sense. To edify them. To grow them up in Christ Jesus. Right? That's what Christ like this. It doesn't obliterate your personality. You can do this as Kishan or Luis or Chris or Joe or, or Kathy. Your, your, your personality and your, your individual uh, uh, being is not gone, but as the person that you are, you're using speech to build other people up. As the person you are, you're generous to those who, who need it, right? That, these are some very powerful examples. And note how it finishes, and we'll wrap it, wrap it up. We'll look at verse 31 to 32. Do all this Okay, and it ends with, um, excuse me, look at verse 31 with me. 
uh, I apologize, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. There's the negative. Positive 32. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Do you see that contrast? And then it ends with the gospel again. As God in Christ forgave you. What's wonderful about this passage is it this whole section in Ephesians is it starts with the gospel and it ends with the gospel. We no longer do these destructive things. We do these life-giving things because they reflect what God has done for us. He has imparted life and salvation and healing and edification through what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. The ground of this is not do this because it's the right thing to do, though it is the right thing to do. The ground of it of this is God has done this for you. This is who you are now through Jesus. Now live this out and reflect this, mirror this back out to the world, to those around us. So that as we live this life, they see in our actions the God who is revealed in Jesus, the God who is revealed in the gospel. You know, a lot of people critique a phrase that um, St. Francis uh, has said. He said uh, at one point, preach the gospel uh, always and sometimes use words. And people are very critical of this phrase because uh, they say, well, the gospel is essentially something that you proclaim, something that you communicate orally, um, not our actions. But I think it's an unfair criticism because it's, it, Francis, uh, St. Francis was doing something that Jesus often did, which is speak in hyperbole. You exaggerate to make your point. He wasn't saying, don't, don't tell people about Jesus, okay? That's obviously not what he was saying. He was saying, we must tell people about Jesus, but they really need to see it in the way that we live. And what better way to catch our attention than by saying, and sometimes use words, right? It's, it's a bit of a cheeky, sarcastic exaggeration that things happening. We don't want to do that because we were like, oh no, if we emphasize our works, our transformed lives, that makes us legalists, right? That makes us obsessed and concerned with our good works. No, no, the only thing that matters is speaking the gospel. We suck, we're terrible, we're awful, we're worms, you know, we're the worst thing ever. But that's not how the New Testament speaks of God's people. It's not how the New Testament speaks of the life of the Christian. The New Testament recognizes that until Jesus comes, we're always, of course, imperfect, and we always need God's grace, and we always need to be repenting and asking for forgiveness even to one another and forgiving one another. Our, we are a people who are a mess, and we are a mess that God is at work in and through. But there is an expectation clearly in the New Testament that as we grow together, as we serve one another, as we put off our old self and put on our new self, and as we grow and become more like Jesus, that we should reflect the gospel in the way that we live, in the way that we speak, in the way that we relate to others, in the things that we do. We bear witness and confirm to the truthfulness of the gospel in our actions. And this is not to, that's, this is not to emphasize or to make us so great and wonderful. It's to make God's grace by God's own Holy Spirit at work in us. It's to magnify God's Spirit at work in us and the power of the gospel to redeem, to save, and transform us. So we need to get off that excuse because I think we use it to excuse continuing to live according to our own self. When we're being challenged, no, put on Christ, put on the new nature, put on His way of living. And the good thing, everyone, is that it's not up to us and our strength and power to get to the end of this, to accomplish this goal. God's own spirit, his own power, as I just said, is the one who will get us to our destiny, to our goal. Paul wrote to another church, to the church in Philippi. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says this, He who began, God, obviously, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Promise will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God's at work in us to help us, to empower us, to put off the old way of thinking and doing, and put off a new way of thinking and doing. And it's his power and his 
attached to that word, a promise that he will get us to our goal. But he's also challenged us. We have a responsibility. We have to step into that transformed life to live out what he has worked in. Let's pray.